So, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for joining us this evening. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Matt. Uh, I'm one of the elders here. Uh, apologies to start with. I'm struggling a little, a little bit of sickness myself, so I'm a bit croaky, but hopefully um, you can understand me. So, tonight we're talking on this area of God's heart um, for the sick. Um, and we're going to, going to be thinking about it in two ways. Firstly, um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about, um, about his experiencing sickness, because I think we can all relate to that in some way, shape or form. Um, and then we're also going to be thinking a bit about how we can reflect God's heart, how we can practically uh, care for people in sickness. So let, let me start similarly to how Tony started his seminar a couple of weeks ago in that um, I'm no expert. Um, I think that's the danger, isn't it? Because my medical background, it can be assumed that I'm, I'm an expert in this area. Um, just like I became the COVID uh, expert for the summary drug mission a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so, so bear that in mind. But um, I, I would say actually a lot of my experience to talk about sickness comes more from personal experience and through illness uh, myself, uh, which I'll share a bit on uh, a bit later. But my hope tonight is that actually through thinking about this area, through sharing around tables, is that we can share our own experiences um, of how God has maybe used us through sickness, maybe God has healed us, um, how we've been able to care for others through sickness. So that's, that's going to be a heart for tonight that we can uh, share that together. So um, most of you know me, but I'm conscious that some of you won't. Um, my, so I'll share a little bit about my, my background. Um, so day to day, through the week, some would say I'm a bit of a myth, so bear with me on this one. Um, you're told that I exist. You think you've seen me at some point before. You want to see me again, but as hard as you try, you met with the same response. Sorry, mo no more appointments. Be back again tomorrow at eight o'clock. Um, so that's me. I, I work as a GP, so I'm sure a lot of you know can relate to that. Um, and over the years, um, I've seen, I've seen, a, a, I've witnessed a lot of sickness. I've witnessed people that are just mildly sick. I've witnessed people that have been severely sick. Um, I've witnessed people die from their sicknesses, I've witnessed people come back from their sicknesses and uh, being resuscitated. Uh, I've been involved in breaking hearts as I've shared news of uh, no cure for people, shared news of cancers, I've shared uh, news of family relatives passing away. Um, so uh, in some respects you could say I'm experienced, in some respects um, uh, I'm experienced in terms of sickness in some respects I'm experienced in terms of my own experience of sickness um, but I would say um, that doesn't necessarily give me a complete understanding of God's heart for the sick and I think um, I just want to make that clear tonight I'm reflecting what I've learned um, through, uh, through God, through experience, through the word um, and I, as I say hopefully we can all do that this evening together. Um, so uh, part of my experience that I should share is that uh, in my youth, when I was a teenager, I, um, I had leukemia. So I spent about three years going in and out of hospital um, having chemotherapy treatments. And, and it's through that that, that really shaped me quite a lot, actually. Um, I was 12 at the time. Um, and God really used me in that. And I often, when I, when I share things with people about things that God has taught me, it often comes from back then through that experience, how God has really shaped me and strengthened me and, and used that experience to, uh, to lead me to where I am uh, today. And I want to just acknowledge that this is a sensitive area um, and uh, I, I think we, we need to be aware of that this evening. We will all have experienced sickness in some way, whether that's personally, in big ways, small ways, or whether that's um, close to us with family and friends. So when we think about that this evening, when we're sharing in groups, I think we just all need to be conscious of that and, and consider that with, with each other. So as we start, I just want to you spend one or two minutes just in kind of groups that you're in, um, just answering this question. What is sickness? So just a couple of quick minutes and we'll come back together. Maybe a few of you can shout out some thoughts. What is sickness? <laughs> when the body isn't working as it should. Okay, yeah. <coughs> Any other thoughts? So 
it's probably different for different people. Mm-hmm. Certain person might find sick. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? No? Quiet room tonight. Okay. Um, so let's look at some definitions. So a definition of sickness, I've taken a few years. So sickness, the state of being ill. Uh, so what is uh, illness, a disease or period of sickness affecting the body or the mind? Uh, and a definition of sickness affected by physical or mental illness. Um, so what you shared is right, affecting the body, but also affecting the mind. Um, and yes, quite rightly, we all experience sickness in different ways and it can mean different things to each one of us. But I think another important um, part of sickness that often isn't acknowledged is spiritual sickness. Um, and, and that's, I think, um, is one of the most paramount things that we do acknowledge, um, that w- without Christ we are spiritually sick. And that, that's a worldly view that wouldn't be acknowledged uh, much at all in terms of our spiritual selves. And, um, uh, Pete this morning was talking a little bit about the spiritual realm and the sense of demons and um, and how we need to consider that. Um, but it, just uh, in terms of referencing something here, so uh, I've got quite a few passages to go through. So they're all on the screen. Hopefully you can make them out. Um, if you want to fit through your Bibles, that's fine. So just sharing here from Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. This is Jesus eating with the tax collectors and sinners. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with his tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus is using this analogy that the sick need a doctor in the same way that the sinner needs a saviour. As I say, we're we're spiritually sick without Christ, um, and that spiritual sickness we know leads to death. And that's, uh, again, we'll reference that in this in the next verses here. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, I don't know all of you here this evening. I don't know where you're at i don't know if you if you love and follow the lord um but one thing i want you to remember tonight is our spiritual sickness is so much more important to address than our physical or mental illness because if we don't address that ultimately we are we are dead um as these verses explain if we know christ and we've chosen to follow him then we're spiritually well we're spiritually alive uh, and the good news of the gospel is that spiritual healing is available. Um, it's available to all who call on the name of the Lord. As we read here, by grace we are saved and made alive in him. So that's the, the great news of the gospel. Now, I've tried to make this not too presentation-y. I might have failed a little bit. I, I kept it fairly plain, black and white. Um, but I've, I've come with an acronym. Um, keeping with the medical background part. Um, so no guesses for what H, uh, so no points for guessing what H stands for. Uh, so healing. I think healing is a bit of a taboo subject sometimes um, in the church. And why is that? Um, I think there's many reasons. I think there's different opinions on it. I think we've often got different experiences of it. Maybe you know, we've had bad experiences where we've believed or prayed for healing and not received that. Um, maybe we group it with the prosperity kind of gospel and think, oh, that's, that's for, for them. Um, and then steer clear of it. Lots of us will have different views, and that's okay. And um, we don't need to fall out about that. Um, but this evening, I wanted to explore it a little bit. I'm not going to go into too much depth about healing because I think we could spend probably a whole series in healing. Um, but I'll share some of the things that are on my heart on that. 
So first we're going to look again at some passages together. We're going to start in creation, uh, in Genesis. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 27, and then verse 31. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And now let's jump to Revelation. So we'll read from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, which says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So firstly, we see from these passages, we see in creation, God made man in his image. The perfect image of God, there is no sickness. God made man as he intended. Um, and he looked at that and said, he looked at his creation and said, it was very good. And we know that as a consequence of the fall, that sickness and sin and death entered the world. Um, and then secondly, we see in the in Revelation passages, we see what is to come. Um, we see the new heavens and the new earth, that there's, there's no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. These things will pass away. So from this, we can see that God's ultimate harm for us was not sickness. God didn't want us to be sick. He didn't, ex he didn't experience sickness, death or separation from us. He didn't want us to experience that. That's not what he had for us. That wasn't his plan for us. But instead, as a consequence of, of this world and this fallen world that we live in. Now, um, thinking a little bit further about this thought of God's heart for healing, Let's look into, into the gospel. So let's look into Luke chapter 4, and verses 38 to 40, which says, uh, so this is, um, uh, sorry, I can't see this very well, it's a bit, a bit dull for me. So verses 38 says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. And then also in uh, Matthew 15, 29-31, Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee and climbed a hill and sat down. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. The crowd was amazed. Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking. The crippled were made well. The lame were walking, and the blind could see again. And they praised the God of Israel. So we see more of God's desire for us through Jesus' ministry. And such a big part of that was, was healing and there's lots of stories we don't hear about. We, we, we hear, hear how he healed the many. Um, and, the, you know, we, we know some big stories of healing. I wonder how many more big ones there were in there. Now, as I say, there's lots of views on healing. I'll share personally my, my view is that God still heals. I believe that. Um, I believe he wants us to pray and believe for healing and not base our faith solely on doctors. And if they say, no, we can't do anymore, that means God can't do anymore. I believe God wants to heal um, and he wants us to come to him and believe for that. But we know that we often don't experience healing. And I think this is something that I have battled with for many years. Um, and there's still unanswered questions in that. Why sometimes he does heal, why sometimes he doesn't, why sometimes it's instant, why sometimes it's over time. When I've seen firsthand how evil sickness is, it's very apparent to me that it's not from the Lord. Um, but those questions still niggle. All this suffering, this pain, this darkness, this separation, it's clearly not from God. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So then we know that he bore our sins on the cross, and also that there's healing through the cross. So my heart, although I still have questions, is settled on this. In the new heaven and new earth, there'll be no more sickness, no more sin, <coughs> no more death. But until then, I believe my sins are forgiven. I'm a new creation in Christ, even though I live in a body that still experiences and falls to sin. Similarly, I believe that I'm healed, even though I live in a body that still experiences sickness. Our healing doesn't have to happen now to be true because we're guaranteed healing through Christ when we come to him in our final days. So a key point for me this evening on this, this sort of healing, whether we experience healing on this earth or not, when we get to heaven, will we be more bothered about that or will we, more, will we be more bothered about whether we've lived for God and let him use us for his glory? Whether that be in our healing or despite our sickness. Let's move on to E, shall we? <laughs> empower. God's heart for the sick is to empower them. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. I could have chosen endless verses that talk about God empowering us. Um, the Bible is full of those verses and about how he's our rock, our strength, our fortress, the armour of God. Uh, the, this endless verse I could have chosen. <coughs> he knows what we're facing. Whatever you're facing in terms of sickness and struggles, what you've been through, what you're going to go through. He knows them. He's experienced them himself. Temptation, tiredness, pain, sadness, loneliness, sickness, death. Jesus has experienced all these things. And the Bible is full of promises of um, the Lord being with us through these signs, through his Holy Spirit. He provides what we need to face these difficulties in life. And I often say becoming a parent has been one of the most eye-opening things for me as to understanding God as the Father um, and how, how he treats his, his love for his, his children. Um, when I look at my kids, I look at the stage that they're going through. So I've got two kids, they're seven and four. Um, I've been there. I know what they're going through. I know what they're going to go through. I know that they're going to have some good times. I know there's going to be some hard times. Um, I know there's going to be times when I need to get alongside them and encourage them and, and strengthen them. Similarly, God knows those things. Right, is. I know for my kids, there's going to be times when I need to really encourage them when they fail when they try and they fail guiding them in the right steps guiding them in the way of the lord and if i want that for my kids i'm sure that the lord god wants that so much more for us his love for us is so much greater a abide god's heart for the sick is to abide in him the obvious verses to talk about with this is John 15, 1 to 5. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He puts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In our sickness, God wants us to abide in him. Why? Because he wants us to have, he wants us to have life. He wants us to grow and to bear fruit. It says in these verses, apart from him, we can do nothing. He wants us to draw from him. He wants us to depend on him. Now, each of us, I know, will cope with sickness differently. For some of you, it might be when you're ill, you take yourself away, you isolate, you rest, and you try and recover. 
for others you might try and see the doctor um, or take medicines or vitamins and there's nothing wrong with any of those things but as Christians my hope is that we know that we, all, we need to seek God in our sickness we need to draw from him as our source as our strength uh, through our sickness and don't think that you can't bear fruit in your sickness again I don't, I don't know where a lot of you are in terms of experiencing sickness there might be some people here um, that have gone through really difficult things sickness wise and maybe going through really difficult sickness at the moment um, but these verses here encourage us that us bearing fruit isn't dependent on ourselves it's dependent on Christ and Christ being in us and we remaining in him but a question might come or a statement might come but my sickness limits me <coughs> and that can be true my sickness can limit us, limit us in different ways and this is where I'm going to get you to uh, talk again around your tables so a few just questions to get you thinking how does sickness limit us in what ways can this hinder our relationship with sorry what, in what ways can this hinder our relationship with or ability to serve God and in what ways can it strengthen our relationship with our ability to serve God? So we have five minutes or so, and then we'll, uh, we'll share back together. Any, any thoughts from the room? Feeling any more chatty now? We're going to shout them out. <laughs> One of the mentions on our table was, was isolation. Fitness can isolate you, and that can be quite limiting. Any thoughts from other, other groups? If, if we're not well, we, and we, it's it's a means that we can lean on Him. Yeah. In, when we're when we're not feeling at our best, or there's something definitely not quite right, we can we can we can lean on Him or ask other people to support us in that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It makes us depend on Him when we makes us more we dependent. can't do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Matt, sickness can practically affect you because it, I mean we've all been sick somehow and it doesn't take much to knock us down you know mm -hmm. like a fever or a bug can take you out very quickly you know so mm -hmm. so it can limit you uh, from doing things from getting places from uh, you know moving around so obviously the physicals we're not as strong as we think yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and then things like me blasphemy and why you're not drinking it and mm. this stops them from serving and loving God and depending on it, they just become aware of it. Mm. Any questions for Bill? I really believe God has something to do. Yeah. I really trust him with it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I've lost my iPad, so uh, it's dead. I'll have to ask Nigel to flick along. So, We'll go on to, we'll, we'll move on, we'll go on to the, the next uh, uh, Nick. I think most of you probably have come across this guy at some point, but I think you know, he's, um, so for those of you who haven't, so his name, I'm not going to pronounce his name, Nick. Um, he, so he was born with some, uh, a rare genetic disorder, which means he has no limbs and he hasn't done um, from the day he was born. Um, and yet he is such an inspirational guy as a Christian. Um, uh, such an inspirational guy and is a real example of how God can use us despite our sickness, our illness. Um, and one of his, well, I just picked up a quote from him here that says, um, hope is in the name of, of God, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is when you compare your suffering, suffering to infinite, immeasurable love and grace of God. Can you imagine? I don't, I, I, can you imagine living a life um, as disabled as that? And many people do in other ways. Um, have the effects of that day to day um, on your mind, on your uh, emotions, having to depend on people, um, a sense of why me, why, why, why me? Why can I have a normal life like other people? Um, but yet, yeah, you. You couldn't see a happier guy, could you? Yeah. Um, and that is the hope that he has in the Lord. Um, so 
yes, sickness limits us in so many ways, um, but it doesn't have to be a complete limiting factor. God can still use us. Um, I think we need to uh, have a heart that's willing in these difficult situations. Next slide, please, Nigel. So, ah, reach out. Christ's heart for the sick is to reach out. I believe one of the biggest traps of sickness that we can fall into, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, is that it can take the centre of the universe and be it right here. And suddenly the world is all about you. It's about everything affecting me, how this affects me, why me, how am I going to get through this? What about my plans? And those things just make our problems even bigger. The more we focus on that, the bigger they seem, the worse they are. And it's it's human nature. If you don't respond like that, you're the exception. That is, that is our human nature. And the result of that is that we become very much self-conscious and very much focused on our needs and our struggles. And I think there's ways that, that I've learned, that certainly through, through my um, experience of illness, it can help us come out away from that. One of them is perspective. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I was going to bring this up in stages. I couldn't find a, a photo that displayed what I was trying to display, um, what I wanted to explain. So I've made this brilliant <laughs> piece of art Sorry. here. So um, obviously this is this is us. There's God represented by the sun, and then there's sickness. And I think I could have put a number of things there instead of sickness. That could have been any kind of problem. Um, loneliness, poverty, um, relationship mm -hmm. problems, you know, um, uh, anything could, could go in that place there. But I think what I'm trying to display here is that what we see in front of us and what we focus on mostly will see, see the biggest things. Um, but in reality, we flick onto the next slide, we then forget to put things in perspective. Yeah. And this just gives a bit, a bit of perspective of, of the size of the earth compared to the sun. And if we're using that analogy of uh, God being a son, he is so much bigger. And if we focus on him who is so much bigger than what we are facing, um, that, gives us, that gives us what we need to get through um, the, the challenges that we face. Some important verses for me in this is Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. It says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honour at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. I don't know about you, whether you ever make a conscious effort to think upon the things ahead, to set our minds on the things to come. But as I say, these verses are important to me because that's often how I've got through difficult times, whatever they may have been, small things, big things. I, I've, I've often asked myself, what's the worst that can happen? You know, going through my exams, what's the worst that can happen? I fail miserably. Um, I don't get into med school or progress or whatever. But my life is hidden with Christ and God and I have the realities of heaven to look forward to. When I was diagnosed with leukemia, what's the worst that can happen? Treatment fails. I die. But my life is hidden with Christ in God and I have the realities of heaven to look forward to. Now, I don't want you to hear me belittling, belittling any situation because we face so much hurt and pain and despair. But I believe perspective is so important in that and setting our minds on what God has for us um, is so important. And I think when we start to do that, it helps us come out of that self-focus and hopefully through that it can give us a heart actually for others which i think is another big important part of how we how we live despite sickness mark 12 28 to 31 one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating noticing that jesus had given them a good answer he asked him of all the commandments which is the most important the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. 
The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment, commandment greater than these. Sickness doesn't exempt us from the two greatest commandments God, God gives us. And I believe that commandment of loving your neighbour as yourself is just as beneficial to our neighbour as it is. Um, so just as beneficial to us as it is to our neighbour. Um, when we can let God use us in our sickness to love our neighbour, firstly, what a blessing that would be to our neighbour, knowing that despite what we are going through, we're still able to love our neighbour and bless them. But also, I think it gives us purpose and fulfilment. In our sickness, I think it takes away that self-focus, gives us a heart for other people, it allows God to use us. And then lastly, T, thankful. God's heart for the sick is to be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 18. And I'm going to read from 12 because um, because I think it links in well with what we should be thinking about there. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge the, those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong with wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I think if I had a, a motto for for something that would spare me through life. <coughs> It's those verses, verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's God's will for us, that it's hard for us that even in sickness, we can rejoice. We can rejoice always, even in sickness. We have so much to rejoice in, and that doesn't have to be dependent on our health here on earth to pray continually, to have him on our mind, be in communion with him always, to recognise all the things that we have to be thankful for. Um, coming back to our friend Nick, another quote from him, he, he said, often people ask how I manage to be happy despite having no arms and no legs. The quick answer is that I have a choice. I can be angry about not having limbs, or I can be thankful that I have a purpose. I chose gratitude. Think through today, have we, have we done that? Have we have we been able to rejoice throughout today? Have we been praying, meaning communion with God? Have we been, been thankful in all our circumstances? Think ahead to tomorrow. Can we do that tomorrow? Can we rejoice always? Can we give thanks? Can we pray continually with what's ahead of us? It might be a difficult day coming tomorrow. I don't know what you're facing tomorrow. But that's God's will for us, to be able to experience that. So, God's heart for the sick, healing, to be empowered, to abide in him, to reach out, and to be thankful. So that, as I say, that, that's some of my, my um, thoughts and uh, as sharing what I've experienced and how the Lord has taught me over the years. And I hope some of that is maybe helpful and encouraging to yourselves. Now, a big part of God's heart the sick involves all of us, whether we're personally sick or whether we're well. We can have a role to play in this. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. There's some challenging verses. Uh, to value other people above yourselves. It links back a bit, doesn't it, to loving our neighbour. Um, and that'd be the greatest commandment. So Megan's going to come and share a little bit about this, about reflecting God's heart and how we can care for others maybe more practically. I think she's going to get us to split up and talk a bit about that. So I'll hand over to Megan. Um, yeah, I guess a bit like um, Matt started, I'll say a bit of um, who I am and then a bit of a disclaimer as well, maybe it's a medical thing to say disclaimer. Um, but yeah, I'm Megan, um, I have um, the privilege of working um, part of my week um, as a junior doctor, um, 
for care to children, um, mainly based in Leeds, um, and especially thinking about children's lungs, um, and then my other part of the week caring for um, our children and um, partnering in Luke in his role um, here and trying to support him the best I can in that role. Um, there, so that's me. Um, the disclaimer is that um, I also feel there's there's multiple people that could talk about this and um, probably a lot better than me. And um, we have an amazing care team here at the mission. Um, and I guess I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them before I started talking a bit about um, what we do. Um, so I just wanted to to name some of the ones that Suzanne had sent me, um, and then I just thought we'd just um, briefly just pause and just pray and thank God and um, for the people that could all probably talk about this way better than um, than me. So um, our care team is led by Suzanne as we heard this morning um, and um, it involves um, to name a few, there are lots of people involved but these are the main folks um, Val, uh, Judith and Jack Meg, Jenny, Bev Anne-Marie, June Margaret, Hilary, Judith Dyson um, Jai and Alison um, and I know that's only, there are only a few of the people that are involved often there's lots of people that, that link into that um, but I guess I really wanted to say thank you um, to all those people that do this kind of caring um, in our church, so unseen, um, unless we're one of those people that have been privileged enough to receive some of that practical care. Um, but I just thought it would be just, if we can just, I can just pray for them for a second, just to thank God for them. Um, Father God, I just want to thank you so much um, that we have a church full of people um, that share this heart that Matt's been talking about to care for those um, who are in need, Lord, and that extends so much more um, than those who are sick, Father God, and um, we thank you that that reflects um, your heart, Lord, and in that, Lord, that you are glorified, Lord, that we see something of you and your love and your care for us, Lord. And God, I thank you for the people we just mentioned and those that are not on this list as well, Father, who do that day in and day out, Lord. Um, God, we thank you for their servant heartness. We thank you for their sacrifice, Lord. It is a sacrificial thing, Lord. Um, and we just um, thank you just for those people that you've equipped specifically, Lord, with this gifting in this area um, in our church, Lord. And we just want to thank you so much for them this evening, Lord. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, so I think if I could have the slides, that would be great. Um, so we just wanted to, in this last half, um, think a little bit um, about, well, I'm going to get you to think, I'm not going to think, you're all going to think, um, a little bit how we can practically, as a church family, um, and I recognise that we represent maybe multiple church families here tonight, but as God's church family, um, whether that's here at the Mission or elsewhere, um, think about how we can um, practically care for those in our family who um, are sick. Um, so I guess I just wanted to mention there may be some principles of practical care and there'll be other things that I've not thought of them here. Um, but when we look to care for people, um, there's some things that we need to remember. Um, we need to remember confidentiality and that just means that when somebody tells you something that you keep it to yourself unless they've asked you to share it. Um, that's not always the case. We can think about safeguarding different things, but it's just remembering, I think when we're in a church family setting, um, we often have a desire to share um, based on our love and wanting other people to come on board. But it's just really important that we ask the person involved whether they're happy for that to be shared or we're careful who we share with or we're careful what we share. So if somebody's sharing something with you that might be re really um, sensitive and that we don't just then share it with everybody that we meet um, when we're kind of talking to people. And um, so it's something just to think about. Um, that we really respect people's space and people's limits and recognise that we're all different. Um, so what I might find really helpful might be totally different to what Matt finds really helpful. Um, and, and actually, we love people really well when we respect that and when we actually find that out. Um, so I really want to love and care for you in this way, but could you tell me how that, that's best for you? Because for me, that might be somebody coming and sitting with me for an hour, um, talking away for somebody else that might be please come sit with me please don't talk to me for an hour that would completely tire me out just sit and be with me in silence so we we care for people we love people well by really respecting what are their um space and limits and i guess part of that is sometimes maybe being able to give people an out and this is something that a few people mentioned to me when i was um, asking about how you feel well cared for um, and for some people, um, you might intend to be, for example, going to visit them um, and um, depending on what kind of illness they have, physical illness or mental illness, that plan that sounded something really helpful yesterday might not be helpful today. And um, so that we're really thinking as we're loving people well um, is actually, is that, does that still work for you today? I'm just going to touch base before I pop round. Is that still something that's going to be helpful today? Um, and then I guess as, as we have probably all been in the position or will all be in the position of being somebody that needs to be cared for and um, we need to be humble to accept that and we need to be willing to ask for help as well 
um, and you know we need to learn to accept people's help and God's love through other people um, and directly from God as well. And so we've got responsibilities on both sides, haven't we? We've got responsibility when we're the person receiving care and we've got responsibility when the person giving care to try and think about just a few of these things. Um, so that was just something to start with. Matt, if you might, wouldn't mind giving out those pieces of paper and pens. And um, so if in your group you could um, have thought about some different kind of um, circumstances where we might um, want to care for people, um, and if we could have a think in our tables about these different specific circumstances, um, I think there might be a few more tables in our pe like listed ones. So we just give out some blank pieces as well. They're all different. Um, so different tables are going to think about different things. So we're going to think about how we can practically care for people with a short-term physical illness is one of the groups. Um, if you got people with a chronic, so that means a longer term physical illness, so they've got a physical illness that's going to affect them potentially for the next few months, years, or even lifelong, how we can practically care for that group of people. Um, we want to think about how we can practically care for people with a mental illness, so an illness affecting their mind, how we can practically care for them. And um, I want another group to think about how we can practically care for the people who are caring for them. So people, for the partners, for the children, for the families, the friends, for people who are in a paid caring role. How, as a church family, we can care for people who are caring. Because I think that's really important that we do that well. Um, another group is going to think about how we can practically care for those who are in the last days of life. So somebody who's dying, because um, that might look slightly different to somebody who's got a short-term illness. And um, how we can love and care for somebody in those days um, and then um, I've asked another group to think about how we can um, care for people with a disability and the word disability means different things to different people and um, what I'm meaning by that is that anybody who's got any impairment of either their body or their mind and um, that makes it more difficult to interact with the world around them so that's really broad um, but any, so there's lots of things that can be seen as a disability but how as a church family and um, can we care for people with a disability so I want you to brainstorm in your groups uh, I'm meaning really practical things here um, and um, and then we're going to feed feedback um, to each other. Okay? Right. Has everybody got a piece of paper? Um, if you've got a blank piece of paper, who's yeah. got a blank piece of paper? Can we have one? Oh, you've all got one with a, a blank piece of paper here. Um, so if, there, if you've forgot something it doesn't have in the middle of your paper, um, maybe if this group can think about mental illness as well, um, so that's something we don't think about quite as much, um, and then if the group there can think about chronic illness. Yeah, exactly. oh, just in general, if you want the kids, if the kids are better. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, who, which group did um, had somebody with a short-term illness? Perfect. Do you want to shout out some of your suggestions of how we can love and practically care for good people? <laughs> oh, Lucas, you're not, you're not shy, so you can come up to the front because we were talking about disabilities and how we don't often use, we sometimes don't use a mic, which allows doesn't allow people who have hearing problems to access it. So we're going to care well. You can come to the front. <laughs> if anybody else is nervous to come to the front and that's just put your feeding back, I will read out what you read out. So that... <laughs> no problem. We had some quite practical things. Um, we started talking about uh, maybe kind of just an, an idea what those might be. So like a flu or a broken foot or something that's very like, you know, it'll go away. But um, practical help with, I think something that church does well is like providing dinners or maybe rides or trying to shop for people. Um, then we talked about maybe companionship, you know, because obviously like if I broke my foot, I have my wife, my family's there. But if you live on your own, that, you know, that, that can change things quite drastically. So maybe um, just being present, uh, sending gifts, cards, texts, phone calls, uh, spiritual encouragement through prayer, Bible verses, or word of encouragement. I think a visitation is, is really important if you can do that, uh, especially to those on their own. Uh, but also, I think, I guess the first thing is engaging and asking, because sometimes if you just ignore, and, you know, the person might have needs, but if no one ever asks them, they might not say anything. And I think culturally, uh, we need to be sensitive to that as well. I mentioned that, like in, in Brazil, we are kind of trained to say no, you know? So how are you doing? You, do you need anything? No, you know, you're doing okay, yes. Like you just say you're always doing okay, you know? So 
but so we, in Brazil we kind of trained ourselves to actually like those that actually want to help don't ask they just do you know <laughs> so, so it, yeah I mean I, I just think that we, we can really be intentional uh, in that so those are a few of the things I'm going to challenge you all um, as people come up um, I, if you are up for it um, on the phone or um, a notepad if you've got one um, maybe try to think of one thing that the person said that you think you could do um, so Lucas mentioned there sending a text um, or taking a meal or, or there was lots of different suggestions wasn't there um, but if you can try as people come up and um, maybe just try to write down one thing that you think I could do that I could potentially do that this week and um, so try and think take one thing I should have said that before Lucas came up and um, but maybe try to take one thing from each person that shares um, that you think I could maybe do that this week um, or in this month Okay, um, who, which, which one's next? I can't remember what order I've got the slides, I think. So, um, yeah, so look after to people with a long-term um, illness. Which group has that one? <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> we have far too many things. We've got far too many things written down here, so. <laughs> um, kindness, um, show the love of God to them. Um, practical helping things um, see what they might have difficulties with just like short-term illness like shopping um, giving them a lift to the doctor um, whatever they might need um, encouraging them um, if you share the gospel with them sharing the bible um, showing that jesus has experienced the same things that they have but um, Jesus went through a lot of suffering, so he can understand what it's like for us if we're suffering. Um, what else we got in here? Um, Yeah, we had lots of things about um, the way that Jesus healed people in the Bible. And Jesus cared about them being ill. You know, it mattered to him. Yeah, that's something anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I think, I think when I think um, about this, um, it... The kind of so a, a few of the things that um, I thought about was this kind of maybe need to work as a team when we talk about providing care for over many weeks, months, years, and um, there's not one individual that can do that. So we need to work together and um, to provide um, care and love in these situations. We maybe need to set ourselves reminders. So when somebody has fallen and broken their leg and they're wearing a cast, that's a pretty good reminder that we might need to help look after that person. But when somebody's got a chronic illness that's affecting them for the rest of their lives. How easy is it for us to have a conversation and then a year later forget that that person will still be absolutely having those same struggles that they were doing a year ago? So do we need to set ourselves a reminder on our phone to send that message, not just this week, but in a month's time and the next month and the next month? Um, or do we need to say, actually, this person needs a lift to church and it's not going to be for the next four weeks while they're wearing the cast, but it's going to be forever. So can we set up a bit of a rota between us all? And um, so kind of yeah thinking about kind of how we can do that in a sustainable and um, long-term way um, and then I guess recognizing that with chronic illness there's ups and downs in that too um, and making people aware that we're here for the difficult days um, and that maybe some of those things that we do for people when they're in a short-term illness that when the crisis points or the difficult points come in a chronic illness battle and um, that we'll be there to provide that intense kind of support as well brilliant and um, so what's the next one um, so mental illness I love, thank you for being so keen. That's brilliant. And there might be a couple of groups, so um, if there's another group who wants to share afterwards, if there's anything that's not said. Uh, for mental illness, it's uh, often difficult having somebody with mental illness. Um, they can be difficult uh, for people who think ourselves as normal. Um, accepting them is part of it. Uh, it depends on, on what the illness is. If it's somebody who's bipolar, they're, they're in the middle of everything and enthusiastic, and then you don't see them because they're under the bedclothes. Um, so it's trying to keep in contact and 
and keep the contact and letting them know that you're, you're available. And it's a patience and, and listening. And, and then um, we've got a friend who, uh, with a child who's got anorexia uh, and it's been for a long time. And uh, just keeping praying because at the end you say, pray, God help me here. I don't know. I've run out of ideas. I don't know what to do. And just praying for them, let them know you're praying, praying with them if they're a bit up for that. Um, maybe getting a prayer chain of, of a few people who, who know them well and, and we pray for them in confidence. And sometimes it's a long-term thing. Uh, and you're, you're struggling with that. Um, one of our children had um, even if severe depression and wished he would die. But he was up doing Sunday school on Sunday um, and then went home and went to bed. You know, and, and we didn't know because we were living further away until his, his wife sat us down with him and said, actually, this is what's happening. And all you're left with is, sometimes all you're left with is pray. Uh, and, and it can take a long time. Mm -hmm. But being consistent and uh, getting the support for them and praying with others, I think, is the thing that we try to help them. So yeah, we're talking about some of the same things that you've talked about with um, chronic illness. So in terms of how to protect yourself about um, having a team of people to be able to share that load. Um, and sometimes it can be quite draining on you. So if, if it's someone who will take quite a lot of your time, just maybe giving a set time from the beginning. Um, other thing that you've kind of already, also already said is kind of find out what that person wants, how they want to be cared for and what works for them in their situation that they're feeling today. Um, not uh, not seeing the person just as their illness, mm -hmm. um, they're kind of a person outside of that, and <coughs> kind of, I guess, still seeing that. Um, so then, alongside that, it's kind of like chatting about things other than the illness, mm -hmm. um, so that kind of, yeah, it's not just them. Um, and then, I guess, sometimes it can cause people to say or do things that might not they might not mean. So not taking things personally, being offended, uh, and kind of seeking training or advice on that specific mental illness that they have to know kind of how that works and what that might mean for them. Yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful from, from both groups there. Um, I, I, yeah, I think I don't think there's anything I have to add. Um, I think um, we, when it comes to mental illness, historically the church has been really bad at talking about that. So I think talking about it is something we can all do um, so that um, we can um, normalise it um, and that then somebody feels like they're able to say when they're struggling with their mental health. Um, so I think that's something um, that we can do. Um, and then for this, this goes for all of them, we can resource ourselves, can't we? Um, if there's something that we um, don't know a lot about and we want to support somebody and love something in it, there's, there's normally a a good Christian resource out there. So if you ask somebody on the staff team, if you don't know something already, I'm sure they'll be able to point in the direction of a book. And um, that this is just one of the books that um, uh, Luke had found really helpful, I think, about mental health in the church. And um, it, it wasn't supposed to actually still stay on my slide. It was just to remind me to talk about resources for everything. But anyway, yeah, it's a nice picture on there. Um, so yeah, that's mental health. And um, the next one. Um, so yeah, um, somebody in their final early days. Yes, we, we talked about a, a, a number of different things. I think one of the, the key things that we said was just being present with somebody, you know, both physically going and seeing them and, and taking that time out of your, your busy schedule, etc. But also in terms of, you know, mentally, it can be very easy once you've heard that, oh, it's, it's the final days. Actually, for us, it can be, you start thinking about, well, what's life going to be like after they, that they've passed on and all that, that kind of thing. And actually, there's a there's a real opportunity to enjoy the final days and to spend time doing the things that they love and, and, and just really show them, a value and dignity and, and you know treating them as a as a person um uh we said kind of the, there's a time for for speaking you know meaningful words spiritual hope encouragement and reassurance and that that i think one of the important things with that is we said that's a two-way thing so we can speak truth and and fit, uh, and spiritual reassurance to someone in their last days but actually the the last words that people share with us are really important as well the things that we hold on to and so there's there's an opportunity to give, give them the chance to do that as well and to um to receive that sometimes we can be so busy trying to do 101 things to help them that actually we don't listen very well uh in that moment 
Um, the, the, there's a lot of sort of practical things just in terms of making sure that they're comfortable and, and um, you know, even, even things like, uh, you know, physical touch, giving them a hug, holding their hand, just, just little things that just show um, your love. Uh, you know, we talked about singing or talking over them and, and uh, spending a bit of time, you know, remembering and reflecting as well. Um, so I think they were our main points. Yeah, I think they're all, all, all really key points. And um, I remember my granny telling me about my granddad disappearing with his, her hair rollers in the middle of the night once. Um, but that's because somebody um, was dying and it was really, really important to them that their hair was done because they'd had the hair done every day of their life and they didn't want to die without the hair done um, properly. Um, but it can be as practical as that, isn't it? So finding out um, what what the needs of the person are that we're meeting um, and all those things. Um, and then disability. Again. <laughs> um, we've got quite a few because disability is a big category but um, we said being consistent so support is often helpful if it's ongoing and if it's more steadfast so that may, might mean taking time to understand so asking them ways that you can help specifically um, but sometimes just knowing the person as an individual well enough so that they don't always have to ask so just taking that time to understand, um, befriending, building relationship. I think people don't ask for help if they don't want to be a burden or just a chore for someone. Um, but if your care for them is more relational than transactional, then I think that can be really beneficial. Um, that might mean as well asking God to grow your heart for the disabled. So, you know, praying for empathy, for strength, for resilience, for wisdom. Um, and also being vulnerable, I think sharing, you know, being open, testimonies can really encourage people and uplift them in their time of need. Prayer for healing, not forgetting that sometimes we can pray. No, we'll, we'll say that we'll pray and then we don't. But I think actually maybe keeping yourself accountable um, or several people, maybe it's a group of you that commit to praying for healing for a person. Um, and finally, identifying giftings. So making sure that they feel they can serve still, um, making sure they know they're valued. Um, it's like Lizzie said, seeing them as people and not just the disability that they're facing. Oh, we said, yeah. The only other thing we... Oh, the only thing that we had down was uh, respect them as normal and adaptability as well and uh, seek advice and information on what their disability is and uh, have a bit of training probably how to deal with it and don't be prejudiced and don't stereotype them i think that's almost similar to what you have isn't it yeah divide that almost into two two physical and mental yeah. yeah, so saying, yeah, Janet said we divide ours into kind of uh, yeah. physical and mental, and then I'm saying about not prejudising and yeah. um, stereotyping and um, getting training. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know about something, don't <laughs> ignore it, yeah. find out about it. Mm -hmm. And I guess that goes into being do we want to be a church family who are reactive or proactive? And do we want to ask people what their needs are and how we can meet them or wait until it becomes a barrier? Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? Um, we were hoping to um, finish just by spending um, two minutes um, I understand if anybody needs to go please please do so now um, but just praying um, so I don't know if you can just um, give us a name um, there's a few names on this list um, of people within our church congregation who um, are run well um, and it'd be really good to pray for them by name but there'd be people that you know of that are not on this list um, or maybe yourself and um, you'd like prayer um, this evening um, for something that you're struggling with um, either physical or mental illness um, and this is time just to do that now and um, so maybe just pick a couple of people off the list um, or if somebody in your group um, has something they want to give you prayer for um, it, now would be a good time to do that um, and just before we do that um, there's a couple um, of things as I was thinking about this um, I guess my mind tends to 
lean towards um, the practical thing because that's what I get the privilege of doing that in my job. Um, but really, what, what what's the point? <laughs> what, what's our goal? What's our intention here? Um, and these are some possible goals. There's lots of, there's lots of them. Um, but actually, everything that we do, we want to glorify and honour God, isn't it? That's our chief aim. Um, and so this has got to be about doing that. This has got to be for him and for his glory and, and not for our own or not out of a sense of duty, but, but for him and for glorifying him. Um, we love because he first loved us. We've got to know him. We've got to have received his love to be able to share it. Um, and we have an incredible good news to be able to share. And I guess one of the things I get to see in my job is um, how when people are ill, um, that they um, sometimes that gives an opportunity for them to see their need for God. And we have an opportunity when we're caring for people um, to be able to share the good news of, of Jesus and of the gospel. And there's a real challenge to do that. Um, and then just thinking about this kind of um, concept of really spurring one another on in the faith and as Christians care and there's lots of people in the world that care aren't there but how do we do that differently and um, when we know and love the Lord um, and um, if you just come to the next slide um, I was thinking a lot about what Paul was talking to Timothy about fighting the good fight um, and how that being not just fight the good fight when we think of all these physical things um, but it's fighting the good fight of faith so we want to encourage people to rest in the Lord, to be satisfied in God, to trust in the power of God and not the power of our own minds and our bodies and to be content in God. And there's a real challenge, isn't there, um, for us um, as Christians, if we're facing illness, um, to do this, to kind of fight that good fight of faith and um, to, you know, it's finishing the race and keeping the faith. And, and not throwing away our confidence. And as Christians, when we're meeting other believers and um, to provide care, part of our role is to encourage people in their faith, to not let them lose their confidence in it, and, and to be there with those scriptures and songs and prayers that will encourage people to keep keep hold of the Lord, and um, because he's the best gift we can ever give anybody. He's the best way that we can ever care. And so I think it's just remembering that as well, um, in our practical, in our practicality as we can love um, and care really well. Um, but we also, this is the best thing we can ever do, is point somebody to the Lord Jesus um, and help them keep running their race um, wherever they're at in that. Um, so yeah, if we just spend um, literally um, two, three minutes praying and then I'll just close and pray. And I'll to <coughs> Father God, we praise you for this evening, praise you uh, that you are our Lord, our Saviour, um, and that you are so much more than that to us. Uh, you provide all that we need, you are strength, our source. Uh, and I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to know that, whatever we face. Um, and as we go away from here this evening, I pray that we can consider how that we can show your love and care to others around us. I pray practically how that might look. Um, remind us, Lord, of the things we've learned this evening. Um, I pray your spur is on to, to really love our neighbour and, and care for the people around us so we can show you and who you are and, and that you are love um, in all that you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.